The purpose of learning about the forest tradition, the teachings of the forest ajans, and some of their history. It's meant eventually to be brought inside. A phrase that you would hear often in the ajans is they say they speak the language of the heart. In other words, they learn the Dharma through listening, they learn the Dharma through thinking about it. But then as they actually apply the Dharma, they learn new lessons in their own hearts. And those are the lessons they wanted to convey. They saw that the purpose of the Buddhist teachings was to be put into practice, as the Buddha said on the night of his passing away. There were devas who were paying homage to the Buddha by sprinkling heavenly scents and heavenly flowers and playing heavenly music. And the Buddha mentioned to his attendant that that was not the way in which one paid homage to the Tathagata, to the Buddha. The true way to pay homage was to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, the Buddha had spent all those many lifetimes to find awakening. And it wasn't for the purpose of heavenly music or heavenly scents or heavenly flowers. It was for the purpose of finding a skill that could be passed on to others to solve his own suffering and so that they could solve their own suffering as well. So this was the, the whole point of the Dharma. And so they went straight for the point. And they're encouraging others to do that as well. It's interesting that of the various traditions of Buddhism in Thailand, it was the forest tradition that attracted most Westerners, because they saw that this dealt straight with the problem in their hearts, too. And it was simply a matter of translating the language of the heart into their hearts. So it's good to reflect on how to translate things into your heart right now. And it's not that hard in some levels, you focus on your breath. Try to bring your awareness to the breath and see what you can notice about what you're doing that's keeping the mind disturbed so that it can't settle down. That right there is where you can dig in. And if you find any of the teachings that are directly related to what you're experiencing, okay, they can give you encouragement, give you guidance. I remember when I was a newly ordained monk. It was about my second or third year, second year as a monk, when a series of books by John Mahabua came out. Which would literally be translated as the, the Dharma set for getting ready. It was a series of Dharma talks he'd given to a woman who was dying of cancer. And it was an unusual set of circumstances. She didn't have that much background in formal Dharma training, but she was, had a very immediate problem that she really did when I were come, which was how to face her own death with skill. And so the set of circumstances inspired John Mahabur to give some of his best talks, in my opinion. Because on the one hand, they're directly related to the main problem, but they also explain a lot. And they're not too much bound up in technical terms. The, monk, the talks he would give to his monks would often assume that they had a background in the Dharma lesson, the Dharma textbooks, and some background in Dharma language. But in her case, he started speaking straight from the heart with his own experience. In my particular case, I remember reading a passage where he talked about how thoughts begin to form in the mind with a little bit of a stirring, and then, and then there's a perception that is slapped onto them. And then they turn into full-blown thoughts. And I had noticed that in my own meditation. I had never seen it explained anywhere. And so my immediate reaction, well, here's someone who's speaking directly to that problem. And so it's good as you go through the forest teachings to find which teachings speak directly to your problem. And if you have some background in where the the Ajahns are coming from, it helps to translate some of their terms so that you find that something that at first glance might not be that direct actually is relevant to what's going on inside. This problem of communication 
is a big one in passing on the teachings. Because suffering is something that we all feel for ourselves. It's in that part of our awareness that we don't share with anyone else. Same as your sense of the color red. You can't take that and compare it with the other people's sense of red. We don't really know how other people see red. We agree that this particular color is red, but what red looks like to other people, we'll never know. Your own pain is something that you feel yourself. No one else can feel your pain for you. <clears throat> and as it turns out, <clears throat> the solution to the problem of how you relate to pain so that you don't suffer, the solution lies within that area of your awareness as well, the inner area of your awareness, your private area of awareness. And so communication across that barrier can often be a difficult thing. Because we let in words and let and keep other words out. And if our frame of reference doesn't admit of something, it just goes right past. Years back I was giving a Dharma talk at CIMC. <clears throat> this is very early on in my time back in the States. And at that time I had a set of standard Dharma talks that I would give to places where I was not familiar with the people. And as I was walking into the room, I realized that this was my second or third year giving a Dharma talk there, and I couldn't remember which talk of my standard set I had given the previous year. I was wondering, what, what, if, what would happen if I gave the same talk again? What would people think? And I was walking into the room, the woman who was in charge of the tape recorder the previous year happened to be standing next to me, and she turned to me and she said, you know, what you said last year meant so much to me. And so I was all ears to hear what I said last year. And then she said something that I knew I would never have said. <laughs> and I realized I could say anything, <laughs> and no one would know if I was repeating myself. <laughs> but this reflects the fact that you know, we hear, or what we hear, often is confined to what we allow ourselves to hear. And part of that allowance has to do with how much we trust the speaker, and also how satisfied we are with the way we already see things. This may be one of the reasons why the Buddha focused on the problem of suffering <clears throat> as the point of communication. Because when we admit to ourselves that we're suffering, that's when we're open to listening to other people. As the Buddha himself said, there are two reactions to suffering. One is bewilderment, why is this happening? And the second one is, is there anyone out there who knows a way or two to put an end to this suffering? That's when we're interested in listening to other people when there is suffering, in hopes that maybe they can help. So you look at yourself, what are you willing to take in from the teachings of the Forest Masters? To what extent do you feel that you are responsible for your own suffering and you would like some help? That's what it comes down to. To what extent do you trust them? My own experience with them is that they are eminently trustworthy. When you read a John Mahabha's account of how he tested his state of mind again and again to make sure that a particular defilement, when it was gone, was really gone. You see the earnestness with which they, they practice. And so try to bring the same earnestness to your own practice. This passage at the very end of Ajahn Mahabhava's biography of Ajahn Mun, where he recounts Ajahn Mun's final sermon. And there's part of the passage he talks about the analogy of being a warrior going into battle. He talks about the different aspects of the practice corresponding to the food for the warrior and the warrior's weapon. The sermon, he said, is the weapon. And I kept thinking, well, who's the warrior, as I was reading the passage the first time. 
And he finally gets to the conclusion. He says, the warrior is your determined not, determination not to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. In other words, you've allowed your greed, aversion, and delusion to drive you for who knows how long. They get you to do things that are not in your own interest. And in the John Lee's example, they get you to do these things, and then when the police come to catch you, they run away. You're the one left dealing with the consequences of your action. How much longer do you want that to happen? If you decided you had enough, okay, here are the teachings. This, these are the teachings from the hearts of the Ajans, from the hearts of the people who practiced earnestly. And they're offered for your, for your assistance, for your aid. And of course, there's going to be an element of translation that has to go through, even when the teachings are there in English. Every time there's a communication from one person to another, you have to translate it into your own heart and into your own issues. When John Lee's talking about the breath, what does that correspond to in your experience? And John Fung noticed that I was having trouble getting my head around the concept the first time I was there. The concept appealed to me, but I wasn't quite sure how to handle it. He said, it's, it's that, it's, the feeling of the breath is already there. It's just a matter of learning to recognize it as breath energy. And then you can start working with it. So take that concept and see how it helps you get the mind to settle down. The question that was sitting here waiting for me tonight was, to what extent do people consciously decide they're going to take on a jhana practice? And to what extent does it naturally come? But you can say it's both. In the sense, when you're doing a mindfulness practice, that's the aim of mindfulness, is to finally get mindfulness really solid. And as they say in the texts, the establishings of mindfulness are the themes of right concentration. In other words, when mindfulness is really established and it's solid, you're going to get the mind into jhana. Because with mindfulness it gives you a frame of reference to look at what's happening in the mind, to see what's skillful and what's unskillful, to recognize certain states of mind as either skillful or unskillful. And then when you know what the state of mind is, then you know, if you've read anything else in the Dharma, how you should behave toward that, which are the things to abandon, which are the things to dis develop, which are the things to comprehend, and what techniques can you go about doing that. And as you abandon things that are unskillful, comprehend whatever suffering you're creating for yourself and develop the path, the mind will naturally settle down. And you're getting far away from sensual, sensual thoughts, far away from unskillful thoughts. And the mind has a tendency that it wants to settle down and find some peace. Years back, there was a lay Dharma teacher who was going to spend some time in the forest refuge and wanted to do some work on breath. And so he asked me to, if he could have some interviews over the phone. And one of his first conditions was, don't try to get me to do jhana, okay? I said, okay. But then as he worked with the breath, he found himself getting into the stages of jhana in spite of himself. So it's not necessary that you think jhana. In fact, jhana is not the topic of jhana. The breath is the topic. Not one of the factors of jhana is the thought jhana. You direct your thoughts to the breath. You evaluate the breath. You evaluate the relationship of your mind to the breath. And as you get more and more interested in that one issue, the mind reaches that state of being gathered into one gathering place. And the sense of pleasure and the sense of rapture will follow. Now you hear these words, go, what do they mean? Well, look into your own experience and try to gain a sense that they're talking about things that are happening in your mind. Some of these sensations 
you're quite familiar with. I remember one time when I got in a state of concentration, there was a feeling in my mouth. I said, I haven't had that feeling in my mouth since I was a child. A certain relaxation that I remembered from childhood, that I, for some reason I had forgotten all those years of being a tense teenager and a tense adult. For many cases, it's settling into areas that you will find familiar once you get there and say, oh, this is what they're talking about. This is how you translate the language of their hearts into the language of your heart. So what they're talking about is not all that foreign. They're talking about their experience as ex experience from within. And you deal with it, you bring it into your experience as you experience it from within. And in cases where you find that their vocabulary is helpful, okay, you apply it. Their perceptions are helpful, you apply them. It's like learning how to be a professional taster. Part of your experience, part of the training they have for professional tasters is not only having a sensitive palate, but giving you a vocabulary to des describe smells and tastes. And the more you have a vocabulary, the more distinctions you can make and the more subtleties you actually can detect. It's like that Calvin Hobbes cartoon where Calvin is saying, ah, the smell of fall. It's so indescribable. And Hobbes says, no, I think it's describable. It's a snorkely brambrish smell. As, common, as Calvin comments, okay, you would imagine that you know tigers with a more sensitive nose would have a bigger vocabulary to describe smells. Well, sometimes it works the other way around. The more vocabulary you have, the more you begin to detect things in your own experience that you would glom together or hadn't really paid attention to. As in that book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain where the art teacher talks about teaching people how to do very realistic drawings of, of people's faces by telling the, the art students not to look at the eyes or the nose or the t mouth, but to look at the spaces between the nose and the mouth, the space between the nose and the eyes, the space between the eye and the, and the eyebrow, and depict those. and found that people who ordinarily had trouble drawing could actually do really good drawings because they were looking at something they had never really paid attention to before. And so they had no pre preconceived notions about how the shape of the space between your eye and your eyelid should look. It was by calling attention to these things that they began to notice what was already there. So a lot of this language of the heart is trying to point your attention to things that have always been there but you just didn't notice. And this is an earlier your, your motivation for listening and absorbing this is that you see that you are suffering and would like to find a way out. So keep that motivation in mind and keep that willingness to learn in mind. So that when you take the language of the heart in and it becomes the language of your heart. It doesn't stop with just with the words. It gets to the things that the words are pointing to, their whole purpose. There's the word atta in Pali, A-T-T-H-A, which is not the same as atta, A-T-T-A, which is self. This is atta with an H in there. It means the goal. It also means meaning. And the two words, dhamma and atta, are often used very often paired very often in Thai Buddhism, as they're sometimes paired in the Pali Canon. And it's interesting that meaning and goal and profit, which is another meaning of that word, they all come to that same word. In other words, the meaning of the Dharma is the meaning of the Dharma. They call the Atta of the Dharma is also the goal. The words point to you to get to that goal. And that's when you can say that you really understand them.
That's when you've mastered the language of the heart.